That was my mistake. Oh, don't worry about it. We thought we were seeing you at three. So we were lazily wandering around upstairs at two o'clock, not knowing. Yeah, but we had the time set up and everything, okay. so that's great. So what do you want to ask me about? Uh, I'd like to know. Oh, yeah, so. Is that your first time in Montreal? I guess not. Oh, four or five. All right. So you've, you've been we around? We came at least two or three times in the 80s. All right. Um, I'm sure we were here for other things. It seems very familiar. So what do you recall the, the most, the best about the city? Oh, well, we played at Fofum Electric when oh, yeah. it was actually fun. Yeah, well, that's a, my favorite you know, bar, I it guess. Was, it was really, really quite exciting in the 80s and very anarchic, sweaty. And the gigs were always really fun, so that's the main thing. Oh, that's right, we came with Jay. That's right, we were artists in resident at the VAV. Right. The college. Right. And we taught them sex magic for a week, the students. And that was a, a nice visit. We went to a drag bar every night. Mm -hmm. Saw all the transvestites. That was fun. So tell me, you're here for uh, three reasons. You have uh, an exhibit that uh, runs starting today at La Centrale, which is quite near here. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, though, because it opened today. So uh, can you tell me what it's about? I have no idea. <laughs> no? We haven't seen anything that's in the exhibition. We spoke with the gallery in, in New York that supplied the art right. this morning, and they said it's primarily collages. But as we've done hundreds and hundreds of collages since the 60s. Mm -hmm. Which ones? We don't know. Probably more recent. But beyond that, we don't know. What we've always liked with collages is you can create worlds that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. As soon as you assemble things in a way that goes against reason and, and linear thinking, then you've actually acted in a sense like a god. You've created something that could only exist because of your creation. And as you know, in the book of Genesis, The very first thing that God does is creation. So we've always seen it as a spiritual path. Art, music, writing is actually a, a form of spiritual discipline, exploration, looking for what we often call the truth. But nobody really knows if there even is a truth. It could well be that we're supposed to just look. Colleges, they, uh, they relate to uh, the cut-up technique which you're re very fond of. They do, but we actually got involved with collages back in about 65. We were reading a book on Dada, and there were some illustrations of Max Ernst, uh, the book he did using old engravings to create surreal, uh, unusual images. I think it's called The Girl with a Hundred Heads, but that could be wrong. And it really inspired me to try, my, try it myself. So I used to go out to thrift stores and find old medical books and old Victorian books with strange engravings and then do copy him originally. Then after a while, that, that got a bit sort of limited, so then we, we expanded into almost any images. Now we use a lot of our own photographs. We'll photograph lots of things and then use those so that it's more of an original look than just taking things out of magazines. So we don't use very much out of magazines anymore. You do develop your own pictures? We used to, until Scotland Yard took everything from me, including my dark room. So then most of the pictures we've been using until recently were Polaroids, which developed themselves, of course. And we like those because they're original, there's no negative, so when it's used, that's unique. And it can't be used again. But sadly, Polaroid stopped making the film. Luckily, myself and Lady J made thousands of Polaroids before that happened. So we're still working through those, chopping them up and reassembling them. But yeah, it does relate to cut-ups. Um, and it's inevitable, uh, probably, that we ended up applying that idea of creating new worlds, um, seeing what happens when things are colliding in ways that you don't expect that we would apply that eventually to tape recorders, music, and then the body. And then the body. So that is the continuing theme as a tool in everything we've done, is what Burroughs used to say, which is, let's take it apart and see what it really says. And uh, surprisingly, so far after 
four decades or so, it's still not boring. You know, finding new collisions and new combinations and new meanings in things is so far still one of the most pleasurable things that we've, we've discovered after making love. After making love. Always make love, both erotically and literally make love for the world. Mm -hmm. you know, we're surrounded by so much anger and depression and negativity and nihilism that the last thing to do is just join in the game. So we've tended to think that the most radical thing people can do now is actually refuse to be sucked into the anger, uh, negative way of seeing things and doing things. We have a new slogan, change the world one kiss at a time. And that's pretty radical right now. Strategies have to change. As time goes by, politicians learn new ways of being hypocrites, new ways of lying, new ways of controlling things behind the scenes. They're getting more and more efficient at doing that. So we have to find ways to surprise them. They're used to being attacked, criticized, even physically attacked, but they're not used to being embraced. We did a thing at university back in the 60s. The head of the university was this really horrible um, lord, He's sort of an aristocrat. So Bryn Mawr Jones. And instead of attacking him, we decided to love him to death. But it was very ironic. So we had a society, the Bryn Mawr Jones um, Appreciation Society. And whenever he was trying to do something, we'd all arrive with posters and banners saying, we love you, Bryn Mawr, but we would all get in the way so that he couldn't get to his office. But we'd be saying, it's because we love you, we want to hold you. <laughs> and so they couldn't say we were attacking him because we were embracing him. Yeah but he still couldn't get anything done. <laughs> and in the photographs, it always looked like we were being nice to him. Mm -hmm. So That's pretty clever. It was a good strategy. They even had a parliamentary inquiry into our university because of all the trouble we were causing. And he tried to complain about us being anarchists. And the members of parliament said, well, we saw them outside and they were saying, we love you. And they seemed to be really nice. <laughs> and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't persuade them to realize we were actually um, breaking down the discipline of the university because it all looked so nice to a stranger. <coughs> so people should think about that. What's a good way to do something that surprises the people that you want to disturb? And sometimes it's the simplest things. Give them flowers. And then somebody else comes up and gives them flowers and then somebody else, until a hundred people have done it and they're buried in flowers and they can't function. Got any ex important questions you need to ask me? Yeah, well, uh, I wanted to talk about the movie. We, um, we decided that we wanted to go public with our idea of pandrogyny mm -hmm. in 2003. So on Valentine's Day, we both got matching breast implants yeah. to say, we're really serious about this idea. And then Jay was saying, you know, it would be really, really good if we had someone around who just filmed everything so that the whole process, no matter how long it lasts, even if it's years, is being documented so that in the future people know why we were doing <coughs> what we're doing. Um, the next day we had to do a concert of The Majesty. Yep. at the knitting factory supporting suicide. And we didn't know her then, but Marie was there, Marie Lossier, in the audience. And she fell in love with the majesty and went away wondering who we were. She didn't even realize who we were. Right. And then the day after that, we were all at the same art exhibition. And we were talking to Bjork, and suddenly somebody stood on my foot. So we turned around as if we were going about to shout, and it was tiny little Marie. She's like a tiny little French doll. And she went, oh, I'm so sorry. And I was like, that's okay. And they said, oh, I saw you, like, you know, I saw you two days ago. I loved your music, blah, blah, blah. So we got talking, and we said, well, what do you do? And she said, I make films. And Jay nudged me like, would you like to come and talk to us at home? So she did, and we said, are we going on tour as Psychic TV in about two weeks? 
but we really want someone to just film everything we do, domestic things, whatever. Mm. Do you want to come? Go around Europe? And she said yes. And from then on, she was part of the family, filming and making videos and just hanging around. For seven years, she was filming. And then, then Lady J dropped her body in 2007. And there was a year when we didn't do anything because everybody was obviously very upset. Then we had a talk and it was me. We said to Marie, we need to finish the film because that's what Jay wanted. It was her idea we should finish it for Jay. So we did a little bit more filming and then she spent one year editing. Um, and that's how the film came about. It's unusual in terms of documentaries because there's no talking heads. There's no famous or even unknown person looking at the camera and going, yes, I met them in 1981 and I like them because... Ah. She didn't use any of that. She did lots of interviews with people. Yeah. My mother, who was 90, my kids, sleazy, all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. But when she was actually editing, she realized it intruded in the story, which became the love story between myself and Lady J. And we were happy that she focused on that because the one thing Jay said was, she said, I don't care about being in a band, I don't care about making art, I don't care if anybody knows what we do or not. But if I could be remembered, I would only like to be remembered as one of the great love affairs. And so that's what's been happening. The film's won something like 15 prizes at festivals. Oh, really? Yeah. It's really touching people in a really deep way. And again, it's that love thing. Um, and that was another way that we realized that that was definitely the right strategy for the time. Because, for example, in Argentina, there were 500 movies in the film festival. And then they have, a, they have different prizes. One of them is the public prize, where people who go to see the films vote for their favorite. And ours won that prize which means out of 500 films, the one that people loved the most was the one about our love affair. That says a lot about humanity, that no matter what's going on, we always fall back to that story of finding love, keeping love, developing love. Um, and that's what's tended to be forgotten in the great melee of totalitarian capitalism that we all dwell in right now. Of course the politicians don't want us to remember to love each other because then we'll collaborate mm -hmm. and we'll share our resources and then we'll have more power. Music is a street culture. It's the fastest way to speak to a lot of people. And so, for example, the new record actually has a track on it where it breaks down. It was an improvisation, but it breaks down. And Eddie had said, what's the message today? And so we actually say, you're probably wondering what the message is in the middle of the song. Well, the message is love. Of course it's love. Don't be afraid. It's just love. And then we say, and the message really is change the world one kiss at a time. Now that's going to reach thousands of people we never meet. People who listen to it on the radio, people whose friends play it to them, people who download it off the internet or steal it, whatever. But that message is going to go out into the culture like a virus. And that's, that's the real power of using music. Music for its own sake is not that interesting to me, which is why we change so many styles. Now we're doing really, really heavy psychedelic rock, a psychic TV that is. And we're in the studio doing a new The Majesty album right now, which is much more about poetry, spoken word, much more precise messages. So that's the way we will use anything. If you said, will you design a carpet? We'll say yes. And then we'll figure out what to do with a carpet that would change the way people see carpets. So our approach is accept all the different things we're offered, then try and make them interesting. That's why we do a bit of everything. And shall always. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. We once sold, sold a story to the, uh, the Daily Mirror in London, the newspaper. 
because a friend of mine's mother, Peter Getty's mother, Anne Getty, used the same hairdresser as Mick Jagger in New York. And she was there one day and she realised he had a hairpiece. He was actually wearing a little wig and the, the hairdresser was making it fit in with his own hair. So I saw the story, Mick Jagger is really bald. <laughs> and uh, they printed it too. I got 500 pounds for that.